Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to another edition of our noon forums here that we present at the American Hellenic Institute uh, on contemporary issues, but also issues that we want to commemorate from the past that we feel are very important that we do not lose sight of. My name is Nick Larigakis. For those of you who do not know me and it's your first time here, I'm president of the American Hellenic Institute, a nonprofit Greek American <coughs> think tank and advocacy group here in our nation's capital. And as I said, we are very delighted to present a new forum on a book presentation in commemoration of the 93rd anniversary of the Smyrna catastrophe of 1922. The book is titled, The Greek Fire, <clears throat> One American's Mission to Rescue Victims of the 20th Century's First Genocide. And with us is the author, which we will hear shortly, Mr. Lou Ehrenek was with us, and we thank you for being here today. There are books in the back for sale. We certainly would appreciate everyone purchasing one, and the author will be here obviously afterwards at the end to sign them. So I just wanted to encourage you, and it's going to be self-serve. There's a basket there, the price is there, so we trust you that you know to put in the right amount and pick up your book. We're a little uh, short staffed today with some of our staff, uh, uh, one being on sick leave and the other one on vacation. The tragic events of 1922 are important to commemorate because they remind us of man's inhumanity to man. Unfortunately, we do see egregious human rights tragedies occurring in the world today, just as they did in Smyrna in 1922. At that time, government stood idle, failing to act. In pausing a moment to take time out of our busy schedules to remember Smyrna, we hope we are taking a step to halt this plague of human rights abuses that we will still have today. And on that point, I listened to an exchange last night on uh, a YouTube clip that I saw of a panel that took place here in the nation's capital. I won't talk about who was doing the exchange, and, but the panelists really fired back, and I thought it made an excellent point. The majority of the people, and I'm paraphrasing, the majority of the people in the world are good people. They don't really want to go out there and commit the kind of atrocities that we've seen on an everyday basis, including what we just saw at the, in Oregon at the college that we see time and time again. <laughs> but she went on to say, and she's absolutely correct, there is a silent majority, which makes up the vast majority of the good people. But they are silent. And for whatever reason, it, those, they don't carry the day. And why is it that these minorities, these extremists, carry the day? And because of that silent majority not speaking out, not being proactive, not reaching out to the policymakers, not being actively involved, and certainly not being aware of atrocities such as this that we're presenting today so we don't continue to make these mistakes time and time again. So it really comes back to citizen responsibility as what we advocate here at AHI and advocating for the issues that we promote. So I just wanted to, you know, I thought it was very poignant and I wanted to, you know, re-highlight it here today. And uh, it's something we can all, I think, um, you know, take heart in and hopefully we will, you know, continue to take our citizen responsibility, citizen, and we're not the silent majority. At this point, uh, we are pleased, as I said, to have our speaker, and to introduce him and, and his book is one of our uh, board members, somebody which I've had an opportunity to work with for over 20 years, and is an exceptional talent in the legal profession, but in so many other ways. He, I consider him to be sort of a renaissance man, um, our good friend, uh, Jim Marquetos, who will uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. I didn't realize it had been over 20 years. But who's <laughs> gathering? <laughs> and thank you all for coming. It's nice to see such a nice uh, group today. Um, you know, in the Middle East, deep-seated religious hatreds, um, uh, military <clears throat> havoc, and the bloody birth pangs of a new state combined to produce civilian chaos. Uh, hundreds of thousands of innocent people need a place of refuge. Many die as public officials and foreign governments dither. Uh, some of the lucky ones who can get away by sea flee to Mytilini or Chios. I'm not talking about today. I'm talking about what happened in 1922 in Smyrna. The similarity is eerie and disturbing. As people of Greek heritage, we know what happened in Smyrna. We know that Smyrna was a defining moment in our culture, like the Persian sack of Athens or like the fall of Constantinople. That's why we gather here every year around this time. It's our duty to remember. But what about non-Greeks, 
people who know little about Greek history, people who have no cultural obligation to remember what happened to their ancestors in Smyrna 93 years ago. They need to learn about Smyrna. Why? Because Smyrna is happening again. As current events uh, show, Smyrna, the first holocaust of the 20th century, let's remember, uh, is still with us, still relevant, perhaps more relevant today than it's been in a long time. Our guest today, Lou Urenik, has done a great public service. He's written a new book which he's here to tell us about and which educates the public about what happened in Smyrna. I can tell you it's a very good book. It's uh, meticulously researched, it's uh, even-handed in its judgments, and it's very easy to read. It's beautifully written. But it's more than just a good book. It's an important book. Importantly, it exposes Mark Bristol, the U.S.'s chief diplomat in the Ottoman Empire, for the bigot he was. Importantly, it shows how the Western thirst for oil has shaped uh, Middle Eastern diplomacy ever since 1922. Importantly, it rescues Asa Jennings, a true American hero from the obscurity he's been languishing in for much of the last century. Importantly, it explains that Smyrna was the final episode in the 20th century's first genocide, the concerted extermination of Asia Minor's native Christians, which began with the Armenians and the Assyrians and ended with the Greeks. Importantly, it applies public pressure on Turkey to stop promoting historical amnesia by distorting the truth. Oh, please. Professor Urenic comes to history through journalism. He is a professor of journalism at Boston University, where he directs the Business and Economics Journalism program. He was a Nieman Fellow and editor-in-residence at Harvard University. Before academia, he held positions at the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Portland Press Herald, the Maine Sunday Telegram, and the Providence <coughs> Journal. In his spare time, he is an environmentalist, nature lover, and fly fisher. His book, Backcast, won the 2007 National Outdoor Book Award and was selected as a National Geographic Traveler's Book of the Month. One critic called it the finest, one of the finest meditations on fathers and sons that I've ever read. An earlier book, Cabin, celebrated reconnection with family and self through building by hand a small cabin in the Maine woods. His writing has appeared in numerous publications, including the New York Times and the Boston Globe. His work also includes the development of two websites that were named among the best in the nation, and a study of newspaper economics for the Neiman Foundation titled The Business of News. Yes, with his latest book telling of Smyrna and Asa Jennings, our guest has done us Greek Americans a great service, refreshing our collective memory of what happened to our ancestors nearly a century ago. But much more importantly, he has awakened the general public to those awful events of 1922 that they need to know about in order to understand correctly what is happening in the Middle East today. Please welcome Professor Lou Urenic. Jim, thank you for that very warm welcome and introduction. Um, Nick, thank you for the invitation. And Georgia, where are you? She's maybe downstairs. Thank you for all the help in, in getting here. Well, it's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to have any association with AHI. do important work, and um, so I'm really pleased to be here. And I'm especially pleased to have you all here because I know a number of you have family connections, um, blood connections back to Smyrna and to Asia Minor. And I'm always moved and reminded how important this history is when I get to be with a group of people who are not academically detached from the subject, but whose families carry the memories of what happened at Smyrna. So thank you for coming, and I'm, I'm really honored uh, to be among you. On September 9, uh, about 11 o'clock in the morning, Beautiful morning, the sun was out. The uh, Turkish cavalry, about 600 cavalry uh, detachment, entered the city of Smyrna, coming down along the K, so-called, of the Smyrna waterfront. Many of you are familiar with Smyrna. You know that <clears throat> it's a port city, and it has a half-moon-shaped 
harbor, and along that harbor front is a promenade. Was a promenade, still is. In those years, in 1922, it was a cobblestone promenade about maybe 60, 70 feet wide, almost two miles long, from the Punta, so called, at the north end of the city, all the way down to the, to the Turkish <coughs> barracks. The Turkish cavalry entered the city basically in good order. Uh, they were filed, followed by another detachment of, of cavalry. They were really the vanguard of an army of about 250,000 Turkish soldiers, infantry and cavalry. Soon, by the middle of the afternoon, Turkish infantry were entering the city, both along the quay and coming in through the back sections of the city as well. The army, in a way, was sort of overwhelming the city in its occupation. By about 6 o'clock uh, on um, September 9, the army lost its discipline. <coughs> It was a hungry army, it was poorly paid, it was not well fed, it had been the subject of lots of propaganda about Greek and Armenian atrocities. Um, it was a Muslim army, <coughs> fired up fighting for Allah. The army lost its discipline and the first uh, place that it turned to was the Armenian quarter. Smyrna, city of about a half a million people in 1922, was divided into districts, the Armenian, Greek, Jewish, Turkish, Levantine, European districts. The Armenian district is toward the back of the city. <clears throat> the army uh, found its way there and began to loot businesses. And very soon the looting uh, turned to homes as well. Household goods, bolts of cloth, whatever were pulled from homes and houses. And very soon people were being pulled from their homes and it turned into a slaughter. Men, women, and children were killed in their homes and on the streets in the Armenian quarter in Smyrna. It was a dreadful scene. Um, in short time, this disorder, this, this looting and this killing, spread generally over the city of Smyrna, from the Armenian quarter to the Greek quarter. And very soon there was no place in the city for a Christian to be safe. Uh, in addition to the army, the sort of the lower elements of the Turkish population left the Turkish quarter with guns and, and uh, sticks and, and knives and so forth and began um, searching out uh, Armenians and Greeks and robbing them and killing them. Horrible, horrible scene. Uh, before I tell you uh, what happened on the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th of September and so forth, let me just sort of back up and, and kind of frame the story for you. Some of you know this. <clears throat> Some of you know it very well. Smyrna was a very special city. There was nothing quite like it anywhere in the Levant, in the eastern Mediterranean. Maybe nothing like it anywhere in the world. It was a gem, Paris of the Orient. It was special for several reasons. First, it was a majority Christian city. There were more Greeks at Smyrna than there were in Athens. Athens was a dusty village compared to Smyrna. Beirut was a backwater. Even Salonika, you know, was a kind of slum, really, compared to, <coughs> compared to Smyrna. Um, so it was a majority Christian city inside the Ottoman Empire. <coughs> that alone made it unusual. Uh, it was also a rich city, extraordinarily rich. Uh, for those of you who have been to Newport and you've seen the kinds of mansions that the robber barons built along Narragansett Bay, you know, these unbelievable villas on... This is the kind of homes that we saw in 1922 at Smyrna. Huge fortunes were piled up as a consequence of the tobacco trade. The uh, American cigarette industry would not have been possible without the kind of tobacco that passed through Smyrna. Camel cigarettes, that's where the tobacco came from. First consumer, first national consumer brand in America, Camel cigarettes. So for better or for worse, the American cigarette industry is a consequence of, of Smyrna. The oriental carpet trade, about 95% of all of the carpets coming out of Asia, imagine that, passed through Smyrna. The Armenians and the Levantines had that cartel. And their offices were at Smyrna and in London, <clears throat> sold these very expensive carpets all over the world. The dried fig, which was a very big item in 1922, dried fruit, the dried fig in particular, uh, created great wealth at Smyrna. <clears throat> The Greeks in particular were very good at growing figs. It turned out, turns out that growing a fig is not such a, an easy thing. The Americans wanted to do it in California, couldn't quite figure it out, so they sent some people 
to Asia Minor to talk with the Greeks so that we could have a fig industry in California. And on and on and on. There were so many extraordinary exports uh, from Smyrna that great fortunes were made. And these fortunes were lavished on the city of Smyrna. It was a place of beautiful homes, as I say, not just in the sort of the Levantine suburbs, the villas and so forth, but also on the waterfront. Marble mansions, three and four story mansions that kind of sparkled as you approached the city of Smyrna from the sea. Big performance spaces for theater, opera, okay. symphony, Greek musical theater, which was experiencing a renaissance in those years. Restaurants, grand hotels, first golf course in the Near East. There was a, a racetrack, yacht clubs, the sporting club, private clubs. I mean, it was, there was a lot of money getting made at Smyrna and the people in Smyrna were spending it. They were having a good time. And as a consequence, um, the Turks who didn't live at Smyrna, in fact, some who did live at Smyrna, they referred to Smyrna as Gavaur Ismir. Maybe some of you know that term. Infidel Smyrna. The dresses were short, the women had the latest fashions, and so forth. Smyrna was uh, different for another reason, and perhaps an even more important reason, and that it had a tradition, a culture of cosmopolitanism. People lived together basically in harmony. Um, they did business, they spoke each other's languages, they lived next door to each other, and they coexisted as Christians, as Muslims, as Jews, uh, in this sort of city-state, if I might call it that. You know, it's important to know, uh, even during the so-called Armenian Genocide, and I want to say a little bit more about genocide uh, rapidly, though, because it figures so importantly into this story. Even during the so-called Armenian Genocide, 1915 and 1960, during World War I, the Armenians were basically safe <coughs> at Smyrna in the city of Smyrna. Regarding the Armenian Genocide, one of the points that I, I emphasize in the book, and Jim, thank you for, for highlighting it, is that the Armenian Genocide <clears throat> certainly occurred. There's, there's no disputing it. We have the evidence and the exhibits and the photographs and the first person accounts and so forth, and the Turkish government's project to deny the Armenian Genocide is a, is a distortion of history. But it, it was one genocide inside a much larger religious cleansing that was occurring in Anatolia. Anatolia. Um, the Pontic Greeks refer to their genocide, and, and the Assyrians refer to their genocide, and the Armenians their genocide, and the Ionian Greeks to their uh, catastrophe and so forth. But it was one genocide. It was an attempt to remove Christ, the Christian population, which, by the way, and very few people know this, 20% of the population uh, of Anatolia was Christian. One in five. Quite astonishing, isn't it? This uh, cleansing began in 1912, soon after the Balkan Wars, or actually almost co coincident with the Balkan Wars, and it was focused first on the Greeks and uh, pushing them out of the so-called Aydin province, Phocia to Chesme, um, killing and <coughs> and forcing people out, and then it spread more generally than the Armenians came in for their intense period of death and killing in 15 and 16. It stopped briefly in 1919 when the British occupied Constantinople, but the British soon lost the stomach for, for occupying um, Asia Minor, and it, it started again up under the uh, Turkish nationalists, many of whom uh, had come out of the, the uh, Young Turk Party. So I give you that background because it's, it's this city where this um, slaughter, this tolerant, rich, beautiful, cultured, sophisticated city, where this slaughter on September 19, 22 was taking place. It um, spread, as I say, from the Armenian quarterly, quarter generally through the city. And to make matters worse, I mean, how could they be worse, but to make matters worse, there were about 300,000, maybe 400,000 refugees, impossible to count them, nobody was doing a census, in the city at the time. These are people, poor people, from villages behind Smyrna up into the mountains and further back, um, who, <coughs> fearing the Turkish army, fled to Smyrna, thinking that this would be safe harbor. This would be a place that they would be 
safe, at least temporarily, until things settle down and then the situation sorted itself out. They thought that for a lot of reasons. One, you know, Smyrna had always been different. It had been this safe place. Also, the great powers, and I include the United States uh, in that, all had a naval presence at Smyrna, a big naval presence. The British had two battleships and numerous destroyers. French, likewise, two battleships, destroyers. The Italians, the Americans had first one destroyer, then two, three, four, and by the end of September of 1922, we had five destroyers at Smyrna. So, you know, if you're in the city and you look out at the harbor, that's a lot of firepower. That represents the victors in World War I, right? The, and the Ottomans were the losers. So the victors were well represented with naval power. So the people, the poor people, with their donkeys and a little bit of food wrapped up maybe in a piece of cloth, a blanket, their babies, you know, women with babies, one under each arm, you know, sometimes carrying old men, make their way to Smyrna for safety. They put down a blanket at the railroad station or in the churchyard, any little piece of shade that they could find. It was a very hot summer, and these were particularly hot days, high 90s, 100 degrees. They put down their blankets and they waited, but they were the victims. They were vulnerable to the Turkish army that was basically marauding through the city. So you can just picture this scene. And then to make matters even worse, <clears throat> How could they be any worse? On the 13th of September, Wednesday, again, sort of coincidentally late in the morning, uh, the Turkish army set four fires around the outside perimeter of the Armenian quarter. Uh, we know for sure that they set the fires because we have witnesses. We have American and British witnesses. You know, this is one of those historical facts that somehow gets disputed, you know, on Wikipedia and places like this. There's no dispute. <laughs> You know, we have American missionaries and American naval officers. We have a trial that occurred in London in 1923 that established the arson. Lighting pillows and cloths and throwing them up into the apartments and homes of Greeks and Armenians. Um, typically a north wind blows, as you know, uh, in the summer over that part of the Mediterranean. Provides a little bit of relief. On this morning, oddly, a south wind came up off the Syrian desert. Very unusual. And it was right after that south wind came up, blowing uh, into the city <clears throat> from the south, that the fires were lit. It was a hot, you know, really brisk wind. And that wind carried uh, the fire out of the Armenian quarter. The Armenian quarter was very quickly devastated, burned, you know, just leveled. Um, Many people, by the way, were trapped in their homes by the Turkish army. They weren't allowed to leave when the fire was burning through the quarter. Uh, went to the Greek quarter, <clears throat> and then generally over the city. By about midnight um, on Wednesday, September 13, the fire breached the line of buildings on the quay. It breached it. There was a movie theater. There were several movie theaters along the quay, and it came through at that particular point. I, this, is, this analogy is a little rough, but I, I think it, 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 it's one that captures um, the picture. Maybe some of you have seen on these nature shows where there's a forest fire, you know, a big fire burning through the jungle or through the forest, and the animals are running out ahead of the fire trying to get to safety, away from the flames, they're just sort of steps ahead of the flames, right? Animals trying to save their lives. This is what we had at Smyrna. The fire was flushing people. They had, you know, the Greeks had locked themselves in their homes, fearful of the Turkish army, but the, the fire was hot. It was coming down on them. The refugees, of course, were in the streets. So they were just trying to outrun that fire, and it was a fast and very hot fire. Hundreds of thousands of people, an entire city of people captured on this narrow quay uh, along the waterfront between the fire and the, and the, the harbor. They had no further to go. Um, the fire was so hot that the hemp hawser lines, you know, the anchor lines on the ships, and the canvas tarpaulins began to ignite on the depths, decks of the warships. Can you imagine what it must have been like to, to be a person on that quay? Women were wetting blankets and putting them over their children. They were 
putting their children into the water so the babies wouldn't be incinerated. Horrible. They were committing suicide, jumping into the water. Some were jumping in and trying to swim out to the ships to be saved, and they were wearing clothes that dragged them under. They were trying to bring children with them. They didn't, some didn't know how to swim. So there were numerous, numerous drownings. The, the harbor was basically bobbing with bodies. Just a horrible sight. They had brought their animals, as I say, the, 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 back, the boxes on the backs of the donkeys and the horses, and even the water buffalo that they brought with them uh, caught fire. And so the animals were running up and down through this crowd. The crowd was so tightly packed in some places that people asphyxiated. You know, they were just pushed together like in a sort of in a tight, tight space. Uh, it was it was a hell on earth. You know, and up until that point in history, it was maybe the worst humanitarian disaster the, the world had known. The senior naval officer uh, Arthur Hepburn, who was on the waterfront at that point, evacuating the American citizens, the businessmen, and the missionaries, and so forth, uh, predicted that everybody on the quay, 400, 500, or more 1,000 people, would die. Either they would burn to death, or they would, uh, or they would drown. <clears throat> when the refugees had just started coming into the city in, in early September, the Americans, the only national group to do this, had formed a relief committee. And uh, they tried to provide some relief to the refugees food, um, place to stay, whatever, medical care, whatever they could do. One of the uh, refugees was a very odd looking little guy who becomes the hero of this story, uh, Asa Jennings. And so let me just say a word about Asa Jennings' uh, extraordinary story. Um, <coughs> little guy, not quite five feet tall, big round glasses that magnified his eyes, made his eyes look too big and his head looked too big for his body. When he was a young man, he had had tuberculosis, turned into Pott's disease, terrible thing. His spine had collapsed. He spent a year in a full body cast. When he recovered, and he recovered only because of the very loving, careful care that his wife Amy gave him. It's a very moving story. I, I won't get into it here. We don't have time. But the marriage, the Jennings marriage, is a very interesting marriage. She saved his life. He came out of that a lot <coughs> broken. So, you know, he was <coughs> bent over this way. He had a hump on his back. And he wore a jacket that was too big, so you couldn't see the hump very well. And he was always looking up at people because they were bigger than he was, and always smiling. So he had this sort of elfin, kind of leprechaunish, broken appearance. And he was a very cheerful guy, smiling, singing, kind of cracking jokes. Um, a little motor of a man in this broken body. He worked for the YMCA. The YMCA director didn't want him there. Didn't think he made a good impression on the rich Greeks in Smyrna. He wanted someone who looked like a big, strong American so he could raise money. Uh, didn't want Jennings there. <laughs> so Jennings was on the relief committee, but he was sort of pushed aside. He was turned into kind of the errand boy for the committee. Others were doing important work. Jennings was carrying messages and, and so forth. But as I say, you know, and this is something a theme that shows through all of his car his correspondence and, and the people who talk about him and so forth from those years, he wanted to make himself useful. He was a religious guy and he believed in a life of religious service. It was central to his life. So he made himself useful. He he occupied a number of these big mansions on the Smyrna waterfront that had been abandoned by their rich owners, Greeks and Armenians, who got out of the city while the getting was good. And he turned them into safe houses for women who had been raped and women who were pregnant. And rape was a very serious weapon of war. It was like a medieval army sacking an ancient city. Still is. And so <clears throat> Jennings, you know, limping around the city with this broken body, was gathering women. He got himself an old Chevrolet. And uh, he managed to drive that. He was picking up women in this old Chevrolet and bringing them to these safe houses on the quay. He's the only person who stayed, you know, the only Westerner, the American, who stayed on shore on the night of the fire. The others who were staying at Smyrna stayed on the Navy ships, you know, away from the fire. Jennings stayed in the city with his people, as he called them, in the safe houses. The fire burned into the morning of the 14th. 
Uh, at one point, the Turkish army began dumping kerosene on the streets that went downhill to the quay. And the British sailors and the British admiral, actually the chief of the entire Mediterranean fleet, Admiral de Brock, was so overcome by the horror of this that he put his whale boats overboard, so-called, you know, the rowboats, and the British went ashore, and they saved maybe two or 3,000 people from the hottest and worst part of the fire. Uh, but it was a very small fraction of the people who needed to be rescued. The fire burned for uh, three and a half days. <clears throat> when it was over, there was basically no food. What little food was left was kept for the Turkish army. The water pipes that carried water to the city had melted. Um, and you can just imagine what the sanitary conditions for these poor people must have been like, right? Hundreds of thousands of people packed into a very small area, no bathrooms, and disease very soon was rampant through Smyrna, dysentery, and every, you know, all of the horrible diseases that follow this kind of, uh, kind of calamity. Nothing could be done. Uh, amazingly, it was the world's biggest story. The entire world was focused on Smyrna. It was the lead story in the New York Times for two weeks. Big type up in the right-hand corner. Every newspaper in America, large and small, Oklahoma, Oregon, Texas, Arkansas, Florida, the Boston Globe, everywhere, Smyrna. What's going to happen to the Christians, the, the Greeks, and the Armenians at Smyrna? But oddly, and cruelly, even as the world, and especially the American public, was focused on Smyrna, the government was paralyzed. In fact, all of the governments, I guess you could say paralyzed. You could also say they chose not to act. Each had its own national interest and calculus that it was applying. In the case of the Americans, there was a very strong sense in this, among the State Department professionals that we, were gonna, we should be on the winning side of this fight because the winning side would control Mosul and the oil fields and so forth. And as, as Jim pointed out, a really an important um, element of the story is that we had a, a, a despicable person, and I don't use that word lightly, as our High Commissioner's Ambassador at Constantinople, Mark Bristol. Um, Bristol said openly, there are three things he didn't like in this world, basically in this order, Greeks, Armenians, and Jews. And he did not, they were the commercial races as far as he was concerned. They didn't, they didn't merit protection. He didn't like Venizelos. Of course, Venizelos was out, but he still didn't like the whole Greek escapade in, in Turkey. Anything he could do to get in the way of a rescue, he would do it. <clears throat> so he basically blocked any attempt to do anything except that which he had to do for the sake of, of basic public relations. Um, he blocked any attempt. Nothing was happening. People were dying. They were being killed by the Turkish soldiers. They were dying of starvation and disease. It looked like they were all going to die. And it was going to be a big mess for the Turks. They had to clean all of these bodies up. So they began marching them into the interior. What do you do with that many people? What do you do with that many bodies? Right? Um, and so first the men were segregated from the women and children, and the men were marched in a kind of echo of what happened during the Armenian period. They were killed outside of the city, pushed into chasms and so forth, and the others, some were taken on long marches, and they died along the way. Stalemated. Everybody's going to die, it appears. But then, again, our hero, Asa Jennings, just astonishingly, on, on the 20th of September, his birthday, 45th birthday, he goes to the senior naval officer at Smyrna, and now we have a new naval officer in the city. His name is Halsey Powell, and he becomes important to the story. <clears throat> Powell was his own man, and I gather from reading his about him in his own words and in the words of others, he was one of these military guys that just seemed to project authority and competence. He had a kind of charisma <clears throat> that brought the Turks around in some sense, he could talk with them. They were actually a little bit afraid of him. He was that kind of a guy. He was his own man. He reported to, to Bristol, and Bristol had told all of his officers, I don't want you saving a Greek. I don't want you saving an Armenian. People had lost their jobs working for Bristol when they had tried to do that back in 20 and 21. 
So Jennings goes to Powell and says, I'd like a sailor and a small boat. I see an Italian freighter out there in the harbor. You know, maybe I can get some of the women in my safe house onto that freighter. Let me, let me try at least. So Powell said, okay, you got it. Jennings went out there, he parlayed with the Italian ship captain, paid him a big bribe at a bribe out of Near East funds and Near East Relief funds. And Powell loaded 2,000 people onto the Constantinople, this old Italian freighter. <coughs> Jennings goes with these people to Lesbos. That was the destination. It was the closest Greek island and a place where they could bring people. Very short sea ride from Smyrna. He gets there in the middle of the night and he sees all of these empty Greek freighters. They had been used as troop ships. And he thinks to himself, you know, ships, if I could get these ships, you know, I don't know how I'll get these ships, but if I could get these ships, and fantastically, if I could get those ships into Smyrna Harbor under the noses of the Turkish army, and even more miraculously, if I could somehow get people onto those ships, um, we could save a lot of lives. Well, I won't tell you everything that, that Asa Jennings did. I'll let you buy the book. And <laughs> details. But I will tell you this. He did what a good Methodist minister does <clears throat> when faced with the prospect of losing hundreds of thousands of lives. He made a choice. He told a few white lies. <laughs> He vastly over-described his own portfolio, you know, his own authority vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. He made promises about what the United States Navy would do. He had no authority to make. And uh, he basically extorted, you know, threatened a foreign government, trying to get those ships, the foreign government being the Greek government in Athens. He had the help in all of this, but they a guy not unlike Halsey Powell, but who was Greek, Theophanides, Captain Theophanides, capable, charismatic, tough, independent-minded sea captain. He provided his ship's radio, he provided the translation, he provided the strategy, and so forth. But by the 22nd of September, Jennings was in command of a flotilla, 50 ships, and Jennings didn't know a stem from a stern. You know, he got seasick when he was on a ship. Um, it's an extraordinary accomplishment, right? It's one of the great stories of an American hero that none of us know about. I grew up reading about the, learning about the Alamo when I was a child at school. I didn't learn anything about what happened at Lesbos with Theophanides and, and Jennings. We should all know about it. Uh, through this time, Jennings was communicating with Powell via Theophanides' battleship to Kilkees. Um, and Powell was working the Turkish army, and he got permission to bring, the, bring in unflagged vessels. The Turks said, okay. Of course, the Turks had their own problem. What they could do with all these people? Right? So uh, they said, you have our permission, but you've got seven days. Possibility. And you can only take the women and the children. You can't take the men. You can take the old men if they're old enough. Nobody in this crowd is old enough. Um, you can take the women and the children, but only, you know, the really the infirm old men can't, um, can't go. So, um, Pal said, okay. On the 24th of September, picture this if you will. Here comes a line of empty ships unflagged, you know, long line of them, about eight or nine of them as I recall, led by an American destroyer coming into the city of Smyrna for this extraordinary rescue. Now I'm going to read you just a sentence from, from Jennings's um, letter in which he um, wrote about this. Uh, he, he described uh, the evacuation and um, okay these are Jennings's words uh, from quite a way out I could see from my station Jennings was on the lead Greek ship on the bridge the smoking ruins of what had been once <coughs> 
the business part of town. It was the most desolate, fearsome sight I ever saw. At the water's edge, stretching for miles, was what looked like a lifeless black border. As Jennings' ship drew closer, he saw that the black border was actually the crowd of black-clad women along the quay. Back to Jennings's word. Suffering, waiting, hoping, praying, as they had been doing every moment for days. Waiting, hoping, praying for ships, ships, ships. The ships moved closer. As we approached, Jennings uh, said, and the shore spread out before us, it seemed as if every face on that quay was turned toward us and every arm outstretched to bring us in. I thought the whole shore was moving to grasp us. And at this moment, this loud cheer goes up from, from these suffering people. They realize that they've been rescued. The evacuation began, and miraculously, again, I use that word, you know, carefully, um, they got everybody out in seven days. You know, there was no logistical support. The Turkish army was interfering, beating, and robbing people along the way. 250,000 people were, were removed by September 30, 1922. Um, when you think about it, you know, we're two, three generations now from Smyrna. Uh, there are millions of people alive today as a consequence of the people who were rescued by Jennings and Powell and Theophanides in those seven days. Now, many more people died than were rescued. Uh, we can't forget that. Um, <clears throat> but there is this bit of humanity that that occurs, and I think it's important to remember that that there was this attempt to save lives, and I think we can be proud as Americans um, that two Americans stepped up and did their duty and risked their careers and, in some cases, their lives um, to do the work that they that they did at Smyrna. Now, as as many of you know, the problem at Smyrna was 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 where it was most severe in Anatolia, but, but really throughout the Mediterranean and the Sea of Marmara and the Black Sea coast, there were people just streaming out of Turkey, right? They were coming down to the beaches and the small ports and, and the cities waiting to be rescued. And it was, again, it was the League of Nations was slow to act, the governments were slow to act. It was Jennings, ultimately assisted again by Powell, who saved um, all of those people. The uh, Patriarch at Constantinople in 1923 credited Jennings with saving the lives of one million people. There's a lot more to say about Smyrna. <clears throat> I'm really just uh, hitting the high points here. Um, but I'm going to stop here and, and I'd be happy to take your questions or if you have comments that you'd like to make uh, based on your experiences, I'd, I'd very much like to hear them. So thank you very much. Okay. The only I'll say is let's keep the comments <laughs> to minimum so we get more questions in. The only uh, rules are just to please identify yourself and uh, and the question. Yeah, Bill Camarino's Alexandria, Virginia. You failed to mention Ataturk, yes. Jamal Ataturk, and he was the commander of the Turkish right. forces. And uh, could you describe what sure. his role was? Absolutely, and uh, he plays a, an important part in the book. The army entered on the 9th of September, uh, Kemal entered on the 10th, came in in a Mercedes touring car. And um, he delegated uh, the military governorship of the city to the cruelest of the cruel generals on his staff, Nur ad-Din Pasha. He was cruel even by the standards of the Turkish army. Um, and it was, it was Nur ad-Din who was sort of running things in the city. Kemal was present, he was mostly involved with diplomacy, dealing with the British, they were very close to war with the British. You know, they were like hours away at one point from being at war with the British. So Kamal um, uh, was present, and he he did not lift a finger uh, to save anybody or to to change what was happening at Smyrna. In fact, he fell in love with a woman while he was at Smyrna, and she threw a party for him as Smyrna was burning. And he said, "Let it burn. You know, this is war." Uh, there's a lot to say about Kamal. He was a ruthless individual. He was a brilliant general yeah. and a man with a penetrating vision for the future of Turkey and nothing got in his way. He was at Smyrna until the end of the month and then he left <clears throat> um, uh, 
uh, and he, he basically looked the other way uh, as all of these atrocities were committed at Smyrna. And, and to the extent that he appointed Nur ad-Din Pasha to be in charge, he is really implicated in the crime because everybody knew what was going to happen when, when Nur ad-Din was in charge. There's no question about it. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Jim. Hi. Um, Jim Stuker, um, Falls Church, Virginia. Um, as a descendant of survivors of what we unfortunately still call euphemistically the great catastrophe. Right. It was far far more than Absolutely. that. Absolutely, right. Um, I'd like to ask you a question that's always puzzled me and that I've asked other authors uh, of books of this period as well. This is an incredibly compelling story. It possesses all of the elements of uh, a classic story, of an epic story, yet, as you said yourself, it's a story that's largely ignored, right. largely unknown, but the kind of a story that would make an incredibly compelling movie, movie. Right. Yeah. incredibly <laughs> compelling <laughs> documentary. Yeah. Let's start casting. Could you yeah. tell me, from your perspective, mm -hmm. why it hasn't happened? It hasn't happened. Yeah. Mm. Okay, there's a short answer and a long, I'll give you the medium answer, <clears throat> and we can talk afterwards if you like. Following all of these events, there was a big debate in the United States, should we have a relationship with Turkey or not? And on one side was the missionary community and the religious leaders, Jewish, Protestant, and Catholic. No. The Turks have blood on their hands. It's too soon to get back involved, given 10 years of genocide. On the other side were the professionals at the State Department saying uh, it was a neighborhood battle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we have our own interests to look after, most especially oil. And there was a debate back and forth. The State Department won the debate. Uh, okay. And in the process of, of that debate, which was argued out in the press, there were all sorts of disinformation campaigns and the recruitment <coughs> of journalists and it's a big subject. Um, the public was left with the thought, you know, that the Greeks, the Armenians, and the Turks, they can't get along with each other. Um, one is as bad as the next. The Greeks killed the Turks, and the Turks killed the Armenians, and who, what can you do with these people? That was sort of the State Department, I'm paraphrasing a lot here, but that was sort of the presentation. And so the country was left with a sense of, he said, she said about this genocide. It was a, it became a matter of dispute, and it was diminished. Not really a genocide. It was, you know, like an ugly war or something. And that legacy is still with us. You know, the Armenians, for example, who have just come through the centenary of their uh, market, marking of the genocide, they still have to argue that they went through a genocide, right? <laughs> and um, it's completely unfair and historically inaccurate. I mean, we have pictures of what happened. We have Germans talking about what happened. Germans, by the way, played an interesting role in what happened. There was little elements of dress rehearsal here. Yeah. Um, so, unlike the Jewish Holocaust, where the Nazi party was brought to justice, hung, executed, Nuremberg, and so forth, and there's a very clear sense that that Holocaust occurred, and the people who did it were punished, black and white. In the case of the Armenians, and, and the Greeks even get forgotten in all of this, because the Greeks haven't done the jobs that the Armenians have done exactly. in terms of surfacing the issue. Exactly. Another long and interesting story, because I've tried to learn a little bit about why that happened. But So um, it's become sort of like a matter of dispute, unlike with the Jews, right? This was a, uh, a prototype, in many ways, for what happened to the Jews. So that's part of the reason. I think that's the biggest part of the reason. Um, I think also, in, in, the, in, the sort of in the era that we live in now, there are lots of sensitivities about uh, what we say about Islam. And, um, and some of that is good, and some of that is politically correct. 
And so it becomes, for a person wanting to make a movie, that all has to be figured out, right? Because a movie is a marketing venture, ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. But I would say the biggest part of it is this legacy of the 20s debate that is with us today that maybe it was a genocide, maybe it wasn't. It was a genocide. We have the evidence, and we have, a, we have our own Oscar Schindler, right? Um, so, you know, maybe this book and, you know, other people are doing work on this subject, maybe that the picture will change and people will want to tell the story because, you know, a book, you know, this is four, almost 500 pages, you know, I hope you all buy it and you all, I hope you all read it, but it's a, like you say, a movie moves the public to acknowledgement in a way that I, uh, a book sometimes does but not as effectively, I think, in, in sort of our mass pop culture. We just need to find the proper producers who are willing to put up the yeah, money exactly. and go right. the dice. Right. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Did um, your name, please? Mickey Athanason. Did Jeffrey Eugenides' book, uh, Middlesex, the first couple of chapters, talks mm -hmm. about the Smyrna waterfront, was it pretty accurately written? It was beautifully written, but it was mm -hmm. not accurate. Um, and I wish I could turn a phrase, you know, I'm in, really, I'm a big admirer of Eugenie's, and I think he captures the spirit of it um, extremely well, but it didn't happen in sort of the way that he describes it. You know, he created, he's writing a novel, you know, so he's sort of making things up. I don't take anything away from Eugenie's, because he did a beautiful job capturing the horror of being at Smyrna. In fact, he captured in, in such a lovely way what it was to be an Asia Minor Greek. You know, the silkworms and, and, and uh, uh, you know, the kefineos and all of this, you know, stuff that was part of Greek culture at Smyrna. He, he describes it beautifully. But um, it's not a work of history. It's a, it's, a, it's a novel. I admire it tremendously. In your research for this book, I take it you, you visited Smyrna. Six times. Yeah. What did you go there to, to, to seek, and who did you speak to, and the information you gathered from sure. Smyrna today? Well, you know, I must have looked pretty strange because I was walking up and down the modern K of Smyrna with this 1910 insurance map. It's about this big, you know, and I'm I'm looking for buildings, and I'm you know trying to find little tiny traces, and basically I wanted to under I wanted to be able to describe things as they occurred. So I needed to know, did the sun set behind that building or behind that building, you know, on that particular day and so forth. So um, in Smyrna, I was basically getting the cityscape. And then I also uh, met a number of Turkish people who were very warm and welcoming and helpful. I needed help with translation. I don't speak Turkish, and it's written in Arabic script from that period, so I had to go through Turkish documents. I needed help. Um, a Turkish man took me, there's a, a, a small but very important story in the book about Theodora, a Greek girl who survived all of this. I think among the most compelling material in the book. And she came in from a nearby village with her family. Her family was killed. And I went to that village, and this Turkish person brought me there. Uh, so there was that. And then I went all the way to the Sakarya River <clears throat> where the big battles were fought in 20 and 21. I just wanted to see what that was like. And I worked my way back um, through Doom Lupinar, some of you who are familiar with the Turks call it their War of Independence. Uh, it's sort of like, they think of it as their Gettysburg in a way. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, I, the, the Turkish army took me around. And, uh, yeah, yeah. The Turkish and, uh, the army Turkish took Turkish you army, around. Yeah. I, I traveled with a... They knew uh, you were writing? <laughs> Well, I said I'm writing a book about the, the Turkish War of Independence. But no. I wasn't lying. A little bit like Jennings, I guess. Did they even acknowledge the word catastrophe and something like no, that? Well, they're very. They have a completely different. Absolutely. Aspect. They view it as like this is you know they were heroic and they were pushing out colonial powers and the Greeks were the agents of the British and yeah. and one. Guy, I hate to say this, but it's true. He was bragging to me about how many Greeks his, his family had killed. They were civilians, and the Greek army was retreating, sure. and the villagers turned on the. And you know, he was, you know, telling me proudly of the number of Greek soldiers that had been killed. This is uh, this is military official. Yeah. Let me ask, what about the actual citizens, if yeah. you will, of Smyrna itself? How do right. they treat 
that part of history. They don't understand it. They don't know about it. <clears throat> they, it's a history in Turkey has been shaped ideologically. You know, it, there is a national story that gets told um, that was invented by Ataturk. And that's what they, are, they learn in school and so forth. And so if you press them on the events of that period, they know that there was a fire, of course, and they know there was trouble with the Greeks, and they know that you can never trust an Armenian. That's the way they talk about it. Um, but not much else. You know, in terms of you know, Greeks actually haven't lived there. Well, there were some, but we, got, you know, they left in the population exchange. No yep. consciousness exactly of guides. you know what happened yeah. in September. Yeah. And, so it's a it's a black hole in yeah. Turkish yeah. history. This is my take on it. Okay. A couple more questions. We'll go here. We'll go here. Go ahead. Yes, um, my name is Irene Diamond. The Amadivis, and we live in D.C. Mm -hmm. And my mother uh, was a good Smyrna name. Yeah, my mother was a survivor. Oh, really? My grandmother didn't get out. But I have two very specific questions. Um, um, since you're so knowledgeable about the area, you mentioned the small villages where they raised mm -hmm. the, you know, the uh, the figs sure. and the, figs, the, tobacco. the tobacco. All of that, right? Are you familiar with a little village uh, outside of Smyrna called Gedankui? No, but um, but if you want to know more about it, because um, I know I can it's not there you. anymore, but I wondered. Um, Maybe you can speak offline afterwards if this is a personal yeah. nature question. Because I have a you know I have a really good map of all of the villages yeah. with okay. their Greek oh, names, and I can that. get that too. And, and there the are other, other things that I can I can provide for you. About. The other question too is the people who were waiting on the coast for the ships to come, mm -hmm. were they could they see the, the burning fire? Or, I mean, were they aware of that? I guess how close was it to them? Yeah. Well, you know, it depends where. At Chesme, probably yes. Chesme is the uh, village at the end of that Eritrean peninsula, that peninsula uh -huh. that's, that's south of, yeah. of Smyrna. And that's where the Greek army, that was the second point of departure as they left Asia Minor. So there was a lot of fighting there. So they were very aware of what was going on. <clears throat> and there was a lot of conflict there between Turk and Greek neighbors. Some people, and there was also Turkish people trying to save Greeks, you know, women to women trying to help each other and so forth. But there was also a lot of, of inter-community brutality. So they were definitely aware that there was a big problem happening. Now they would have, from there, I'm going to say, yeah, they probably would have seen the pillars of smoke. You could smell the smoke in Constantinople. I mean, the fire was that big. Um, but so they, they would have seen the smoke. They definitely would have seen the soldiers. The Greek Navy continued to bombard from sea, you know, the retreating, trying to cover the tracks, you know, the, the retreat of the Greek army. So um, they knew that they were involved in something very big and catastrophic, for sure. Thank you. Uh, my name is Connie Zalama. I'm with the American Kurdish Information Network. Oh, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. In 19, this is another complicated strand in the story. In 1922, two years after 1922, Ataturk banned Khalifat. Um, and um, today we have a government in Ankara that officially says it's against the Islamic State, but secretly actually roots for it. Um, the border has been like an open door for 25,000 foreign fighters to go there. Um, I know that this, the today is different than 1922, but um, given what's unfolding, given the refugees that are mm -hmm. taking the same route today, and the U.S. government's position in terms of Obama administration, right. hands off policy, right. and with, right. with yeah, with, can you compare the two? Well, there's a lot to say, of course. Um, yeah, I think there are comparisons. You know, at, at the most fundamental, we have uh, radical. Uh, religious people, Islamists, killing Christians because of the religious divide. So there is that. Um, in terms of American foreign policy, we continue to make the calculation, right? You know, Obama will not use the genocide word. And why won't he? It's because Turkey is so important in NATO. And it's on the southern flank of Russia and so forth. So there's a strategic consideration about the way in which Obama handles um, uh, Turkey and, and so forth. Um, and then, of course, it's impossible not to look at this situation and not draw parallels, in, you know, with the refugees. 
I mean, you know, people are leaving places because they have to leave them. They're afraid for their lives. And they're taking a few possessions and they're getting in little boats and doing what they have to to get mm -hmm. to, of all places, Lesbos. Mm -hmm. So I would draw those parallels. I don't know if that answers mm -hmm. your question. Uh, I will say more broadly, the, the vision that Ataturk had, the Kamalist vision for Turkey, seems to be eroding, maybe even crumbling under Erdogan. He is nostalgic, I think, for Ottoman times, right? Ottoman architecture, Ottoman names, uh, uh, the return of Islam to the public space and so forth. Um, and so it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. It, it, it's, it's amazing, really, that Kemal was able to enforce secularism on Turkey. It was a pious Islamic nation. Um, but we're seeing that we're seeing the cracks in that, obviously, and we have been now for a decade. We're going to have to end it there. I'm sorry. Uh, our speaker also has a plane to catch as well. I do I'll stick around want to thank you uh, very much. I think you, you painted a tremendous picture, not a pretty one, in the sense of the the facts on the ground, but uh, you British painted a picture with your words today mm -hmm. regarding uh, better than I've ever heard from a speaker or even from a book that I've read. So I do look forward to completing the book, which I've started, but I've not had a chance to completely read it, although I've read other versions of the story. So uh, again, I, I thank you very much, and please another uh, round of applause. For Yeah. I have some closing comments real okay. quick. Okay. Books are number one, <laughs> white refreshments number two. But as it relates to our State Department, number three, and I can never lose an opportunity you know, to attack our policies regarding Turkey, but this seems for, you know, for 100 years or more, that country continues to be the pillar of instability for a very geostrategic important region for U.S. interest. But yet, for whatever reason, the policy continues to be the same as it was in 1922, continued through the 50s, certainly escalated again and brought more to the forefront with the real politic of Henry Kissinger in his uh, view of the way he, tra he treated Turkey as, as relates to Cyprus, and it continues today. So no matter what this country does, it continues to be treated with immunity from our government. Why? I don't know. And I speak with these people all the time. But it is something that continues to press me and will continue to haunt me till the day I die unless some of these issues are solved. And that becomes an issue for all of us to continue to make that point as well. Uh, and so the only thing I would disagree with you, Professor, is Turkey is not important. Only because it doesn't provide itself to be important. And if somebody, is, a country is not uh, provides what you ask of it or what you think it can provide, then for you it becomes useful. And Turkey throughout history has been an unfaithful partner, partner of the United States and U.S. interests without going into the whole timeline and it including uh, its efforts on ISIS. And Connie is absolutely correct. Recruited, facilitated, created, continues to help them economically and so forth and so on. Right. So it goes on and on and on and yet we continue business as usual in Turkey and until that changes, I submit to you, we're going to continue to have these problems in the, in the, you know, in the, in the Middle East.